All right, Adam, thanks for being with me today. Sure. <laughs> Appreciate it. So uh, tell our listeners, our viewers, a little bit about yourself, please. Sure. So Adam Cuppis, uh, work here at Iowa Farm Bureau on the Renew Rural Iowa Economic Development Initiative and then manage our associated rural vitality funds. Um, so Iowan from Jackson County, from Bellevue, Iowa, went to Iowa for undergrad, Drake for law. Um, upon graduation, joined a, a startup vaccine company in Ames called Harris Vaccines. And then um, after that, joined Farm Bureau on this Renew Rural Iowa initiative. Sure. So what's the difference between being in a startup, Harris <laughs> Vaccines, and being on the other side of the table as an investor? Yeah, so it's really interesting to see both sides. Um, I would say when you're inside of one of these startup companies and trying to build one of these companies, uh, all you think about all day long, eat, sleep, and breathe, so to speak, is, is what you're working on, what the business is trying to do. Uh, when you're on this side, you sort of get a, a higher level picture of what's going on. So you, you get way down in the weeds on a particular issue inside of one of these companies, but when you're on this side of the table, on the investor or mentor side of the table, you can kind of sort of sit back and say, okay, but how does that play into the bigger picture? And, and uh, if, it's a if, it's a bigger pro if, it, if it's a problem that's occurring in the moment inside of a company, it seems very, very large, but in the, when you sit on this side of the table, you kind of can take a step back and say, well, yeah, but that's fixable, right? <laughs> that's actually not that big of a deal. So Benefit of perspective. Yes, mm -hmm. perspective is everything in this world. So mm, Good. Well, Iowa Farm Bureau Federation is a big supporter of the Agricultural Entrepreneurship Initiative at Iowa State University. And Adam, it was probably two to three years ago that we began to talk about the idea of what became the Ag Startup Engine. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you kind of give your version of why um, you've supported the idea, first of all, of the Ag Startup Engine and then actually became an investor and a very active mentor. Yeah. So, so Iowa State University's Ag Entrepreneurial Initiative has been going on for a long time, a number of years. And what's really interesting is that not just the students that are going through the program, but the number of alumni that have been through your program and then have come back to you in the program and said, hey, I've got this idea. And when you look at some of these ideas, you start to see sort of consistently one to two to three to four, even more a year that are sort of like, whoa, that's kind of interesting, right? So, so what Ag Startup Engine represents, so you, t you take that sort of experience and then you sort of take um, kind of me and my personal experience coming straight out of school and, and going to work on uh, the vaccine company, there, were, there was this little gap that sort of existed here in Iowa where when you're young, relatively young and you're trying to build something that, that's pretty unique and pretty novel, um, it's really difficult to, to find the resources you need to, 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 to get going. So what Ag Startup Engine represents is nothing more than a collection of the resources all put in one place. And so from Farm Bureau's perspective, from my perspective, it sort of was a natural, well, we're already helping Ag, uh, Ag Entrepreneurial Initiative, why not then help create the next logical step for, mm -hmm. for the high-performing students. Yeah, do you think there's a, so the ag startup engine might be part of it, but do you think there's a difference in the ecosystem for entrepreneurs in the ag tech sector in Iowa in 2018 versus when you were a part yeah. of your first startup? Yeah, it's night and day. Um, <laughs> it really is. And if you think about it, though, um, really, I mean, Iowa, at the end of the day, is the center of agriculture, right? Not just in the country, but worldwide. It really is. And so you have the expertise here. You have Iowa State. You have all the expertise sitting inside of Iowa State, basically all within walking distance of the research park in Ames. Um, so, so it's all there, it's just coordinating it all and putting it all into one sort of central pool where, where it's easily accessible by the entrepreneurs themselves. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is what Ag Startup Engine represents. Great. Well, the, the, the aim of the Ag Startup Engine is agricultural technology, which agriculture is broad, agricultural technology is still broad. But mm -hmm. as you think about the most compelling opportunities in agricultural technology, Adam, how do you think about those, whether it be by category, types of opportunities, areas that you think are particularly relevant? Yeah, so um, anytime there's, a, there's sort of a legacy production system in place, it's always, to me, it sort of is like, oh, that's kind of interesting. That looks like an opportunity to create something new, right, to sort of improve upon it. Um, so 
if you look at the, the vaccine company that I mentioned previously, I mean, that was nothing more. At the end of the day, I'm sort of downplaying it, but it was a, a new way of making vaccines that mm -hmm. was faster, cheaper, safer, right? Vaccines, um, nothing new, but a better way, faster, way, cheaper way of producing them. Production mm -hmm. platform, completely new, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other opportunities that exist, I mean, we've, we've got uh, automation, seriously. We've got a uh, labor shortage that's out there all across really the Midwest, rural areas, and automation sure could mm -hmm. help a lot in, in terms of taking some of these tasks that could easily be automated but are currently being performed um, by, by individuals and moving those, automating those tasks and moving those individuals into areas on farm that may be of, of uh, higher value. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a big one for me as well. Certainly. So the other side of opportunities is challenges, sure. <laughs> right? And so um, agriculture by its very nature is seasonal. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature plays a huge role. Um, market risk arising from, <laughs> from Mother Nature, but from policy issues, a number of different things. So as you think about challenges particular to agricultural technology, whether it's about implementation, whether it's about market acceptance or anything else, what do you think? some of the primary challenges are that entrepreneurs, investors that are interested in ag tech need to be clear-eyed about and what needs to be overcome to be successful? Yeah, so, so production agriculture at the end of the day is a commodity environment, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've got really tight margins all the way across the board for the most mm -hmm. part. And so really, as an entrepreneur, you really, you really, unlike perhaps any other industry, you have to be thinking about how your product is truly delivering value to the end user. Mm -hmm. And that product and that value has to be quantifiable in, in a way that you can clearly demonstrate a return on the investment for that grower, for example, or that producer, for example, mm -hmm. such that uh, it's, it becomes almost a no-brainer for them to, to purchase it. The good news is that as technology sort of uh, comes on board, new technologies come on board, it allows for that, but you have to figure out how to actually use it to, mm -hmm. to unlock that potential. So anyway, I think the, the same sort of concept of these being challenges or obstacles with new technology, you, they also represent opportunities, mm -hmm. right? You just got to figure out how to, how to do it in such a way that, that is actually driving true value back to the end user. And as you think about some of the portfolio companies that we have as part of the ag startup engine and that key challenge of a clear and compelling value proposition, mm -hmm. are there any examples that come out for any of the businesses, entrepreneurs that are doing particularly well? Yeah, so uh, I mean, think of performance livestock analytics, right? Um, that is the first, uh, one of the first cloud-based production management systems for livestock producers. Um, it's you're taking a system that was disparate <laughs> and was on paper for the most part uh, and was time consuming um, and it's an everyday sort of activity that that they have now simplified very easily and intuitively and saved producers countless hours on farm on on in system so and explaining what their break even is what a yeah what a great concept <laughs> exactly so so there's that I, I think what Colin and what smart egg uh, is doing is is the same thing. I mean, you've got you've got yes, you've got some automation technology that's there and or coming, mm -hmm. but what you don't have is sort of across equipment providers, one platform that applies for everybody, mm -hmm. and that's what's really compelling about Colin is he's sort of democratizing automation, mm -hmm. which is crazy, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he's doing it. Mm -hmm. So, well. Part of the mission at the Egg Startup Engine is about mentoring. And mentoring, I'm sure, is part of your portfolio companies and your investments, whether it's you and your team here, whether it's others that you can bring in. That's a, a big part of the process, in, uh, in my experience. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, people making a difference in an entrepreneur's path at the right time, you know, in the right way is, is a big part of it. So did you think about some of the high impact entrepreneurial people that that you've met, what are some of the common characteristics that they have, some of the skills and behavior, some of the things maybe that you, in, in the first part of your career, or even now, uh, emulate or imitate? Yeah. yeah, it's a really good question. So, so there's one that, that's common amongst all of them, and that is the, the ones that succeed flat out never give up, right? <laughs> so they're gonna hit every obstacle that comes along, ev along the way in every single company that we're uh, business that they start and they're going to continue to plow forward and continue to figure out a way around it 
and that's common amongst all of the ones that make it. Um, the other thing I would say is there's sort of this inquisitive mind or curious mind aspect. So the, the idea that there's this problem out there and they may, uh, each of them, each of the entrepreneurs may think that they've, they've come up with a solution, but they, they ground test it or ground truth it and sort of dig into the problem and really fully understand it at a level that you or I may never spend the time trying to, trying to fully understand the problem. So it's really interesting. You can see night and day the difference between, at least at this really early stage, those that have that inquisitive mind and are willing to go that extra step to sort of fully dig into the problem, fully grasp it, fully understand it, and fully develop a solution that truly solves it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's, that's the, those two things separate uh, the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. That's great. What are some of the most important business lessons that you've learned along the way? Um, you know, persistence certainly in the face of obstacles and problems. Sure. You know, you can view that as a personal characteristic and, and maybe even a, a business skill as well. But you know, from a, a business perspective, common things that entrepreneurs talk about would be financial issues sure. and raising capital and you know managing that capital correctly when you have it. But as you think about kind of lessons that you've learned, whether it's being a part of a business yourself or watching your portfolio companies. Um, what are some of the important lessons that you've drawn? Yeah, I would say uh, for sure, um, recognize as an entrepreneur, recognizing that you don't know everything. And so surrounding yourself with people who can fill in the gaps uh, that, that you may not have strengths in, uh, that's really key. Um, that whole concept of sort of a mentor network is so critical and it's also really difficult to build and to focus on right away. But if you build it from the get go, it actually really helps, which again, going to the Ag Startup Engine, that's kind of the concept, right? Mm -hmm. We're sort of baking in a mentor network so that people can pull the expertise they need when they need it, right? Um, so, so I would say that's one. I would say the, the early stages of financing the business is always the easiest part to mess up. Um, it's if you think about all the things that the entrepreneur generally either themselves or themselves and, the co and their co-founders are thinking about financing the business is last on the list. It's probably further like below eating, for example. <laughs> so the problem is if you mess it up at the very beginning, it's, it messes up everything else from that point forward. So mm -hmm. it, what I really like about the Ag Startup Engine is that there's a clear, concrete financing path for these businesses that gets it right from the very beginning so that at the very least, that potential trip up is removed, mm -hmm. or at least lessened as best as possible. Is it a, from a financial perspective, you know, when you talk about how those early decisions, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you get yourself on a bad path, that's, you know, is it sort of a, for lack of a better term, a Goldilocks thing, you know, not too warm, not too cold, not too much, not too little, the right money at the right time, you know, is it about timing, amount, or just all of those things mixed up, or right source, which is always another sure. issue of, if I get outside capital, what sources are the right sources? Who are the right investors? Yeah, so it's, I would say it's custom to every single company. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really on the founder and the founding team to sort of take a step back and say, what do we, what do we truly need? Mm -hmm. And it's really about, um, at the early stages, what, what do we need from an investment perspective to get us to the next milestone mm -hmm. and the next milestone after that? And so whatever that mi milestone may be for that particular company, how best can we put together the capital that we need to get there? And then you sort of break it down and you go, okay, well, there's a thousand million different financing sources that we could, uh, we could pull capital from, which one makes the most sense for us? And for each company, it's gonna be slightly different, but that's, again, going towards this sort of ag startup engine concept, right? It's a number of different financing partners all in the same place all providing input at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So a logical place to start when you're starting your first business is to start here, mm -hmm. right? Because you've got access to what you need at the very beginning. And, and I, I truly believe that there's no better collection here in Iowa of, of financing sort of resources and expertise than what you've built here with Ag Startup. Mm -hmm. so. Well, you look at the numbers, and even with agricultural technology, 
you know, there's big, high profile at least, large dollar amount investments that occur in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. Other places as well, but as with technology as a whole, a lot goes on there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My first company, um, we ended up getting money from Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. New York City, Atlanta. As you talked about, I can chart my career and say things are a lot different, better, richer here today mm -hmm. in the Midwest and certainly in central Iowa than they were 20 years ago mm -hmm. when I started my first company. But can you elaborate a little bit on kind of what is developing kind of here in central right. Iowa and, and, and what's good for entrepreneurs? and finding investors and just the overall ecosystem and beyond even investment. Yeah, so I would say that the thing you got to remember again is as an entrepreneur is that when you look at the state of Iowa, when you look at the uh, Iowa State University, when you look at Ames, Iowa, and when you look at the Iowa State University Research Park, right, you're in the center, the heart of agriculture. There are, uh, at the end of the day, I mean, a, there's a concentration of capital and expertise here that you mm -hmm. can not find anywhere else on the planet. You just can't. So if you're going to start in agriculture, in ag technology, why would you want to start anywhere else, right? And then the sort of next level of analysis there is, okay, well, if you're going to start here, then um, why do you need capital from anywhere else? There's more capital here in agriculture than there really is anywhere else as well. So if, if you're <laughs> going to do it, no offense to what you just said, but <laughs> Why take East Coast, West Coast money? Why take money from anywhere else but right here? It makes more sense. That money is going to, is, um, for lack of a better term, going to work for you as an entrepreneur, right? Because you're right in the backyard. You're, you're getting access to an investor is making a strategic investment in you mm -hmm. to try to further you along to hopefully see a return on that investment mm -hmm. someday. Well, uh, <laughs> It sure helps when you can knock on their door and say, hey, can you help me with this or that, mm -hmm. right? So, so again, uh, to your question, I think Ames, Iowa makes the most sense um, of anywhere on the planet, quite frankly. Great. Well, I've had the privilege of watching you interact with um, our students at Iowa State University presenting very early stage mm -hmm. <laughs> business concepts. Mm -hmm. um, you never, to my knowledge, grind your teeth <laughs> <laughs> if you should sure. <laughs> during some of those. The great supporter of those. I've watched you with, with them after they get out and they work on their business concept for a while, but still pretty raw. We've had the privilege to sit on a board of directors together sure. um, and, and interact in a lot of ways. And so you, you, what I always appreciate when you're interacting with entrepreneurs is, is your uh, ability to provide insight at key moments mm -hmm. based upon experience and observation. So I wonder if there's any kind of key and meaningful insights that you've developed you know, how did you get that? Where did it come from? How do you share that at the right time in the right place with those that you're, you're mentoring, serving on the board or whatever the capacity may be? Yeah, it's really interesting. So having been through the experience, both myself with the business that I've started and in conjunction with others, uh, with the vaccine company I mentioned, uh, it's really interesting. As you're building a business, you kind of run into roughly the same problems along the way, right? They may be bigger or smaller or, you know, slightly shaped in a different way, but at the end of the day, they're mostly the same. And Even if entrepreneurs feel like they're experiencing it for the first time exactly, in the history of the world? <laughs> exactly. So, so all I keep seeing is sort of the same problems that we experienced previously or that I experienced previously, and I keep coming back to, well, okay, look, I'm here at this table. We made this mistake. Please, whatever you do, I don't care what mistake you make, but don't make the same mistake we did, right? That's all I'm asking. And so when those opportunities present themselves, I simply try and share sort of the insight that, look, we tried this, it didn't work, here's why. And uh, you might want to think about slightly a different path as you go about solving this particular problem. It's, mm -hmm. it's really that simple. It's what's been amazing to me is just how frequently it's roughly the same problems that occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes sort of a, you know, I hate to tell the same story a thousand different times, but you end up like they're meaningful because- if they're really good stories, that's yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly, and they all come from, at the end of the day, an experience that, um, that happened, and they all also seem to have come, like the, the biggest sort of insights or the biggest sort of learning seem to have come at a time when uh, you know, we were 
struggling. Our, our mm -hmm. backs were against the wall, and so that's what that's when everything becomes clear, and it sort of forces you to make decisions that uh, to save the company, or to save the idea, or save the vision. So that's also been kind of consistent across each. Is when you when you get into these tough spots. Um, just remembering back to the lessons that were sort of learned when you got there and how you figured out a way around it. So. so in one of my classes, I talk about the notion of managing cash in a small business situation. Mm -hmm. It's a basic rule. Mm -hmm. Never run out of cash. Mm -hmm. It sounds very simple, but small businesses find about a thousand different ways to mess that up. Mm -hmm. and so I tell a story at, at markets where we had a big bill that was due from a very large agricultural business, Dow Agri-Sciences. I don't think they'll mind me sharing this. <laughs> <laughs> but the accounts payable, you know, and they were supportive. The people that made the business decisions were supportive of, of us being paid, but Dow Agri-Sciences is a big company, and so they have an accounts payable department. Well, the accounts payable person in charge of paying companies that started with the letter E went on maternity leave. And so we weren't going to get paid. And we were out of money. Right. <laughs> we weren't like, we didn't have a banking relationship, and we had like a payroll coming up. Right. And so we found the lady that ran the D's was there. And so we had them write a check to D markets. <laughs> and then I just took my pen and I filled it in. And it makes First sense. American Bank cashed it. Okay, got it. <laughs> and we sort of got through it. Anyway, are there any particular anecdotes from? Here's vaccines that sure. you don't think Hank and Joel and yeah. your colleagues would mind sharing. Yeah, so 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 if you look at um, sort of my mentors, right, uh, the people who helped me before I'd been able to turn around and help other people, right? Hank was one of them. Dr. Hank Harris, founder of Harris Vaccine. Uh, I remember very early on him asking me, "How much cash do we have in the bank, and how much cash are we going to have by the end of next month?" And I didn't know the answer. And I was CFO of the company, so <laughs> I should have probably known the answer. So anyway, he, he looked at me and he said, that will be the last time you ever answer that question like that. And <laughs> from that point forward, I always made sure that I made a little cash graph every single week and knew exactly where our cash was today, tomorrow, next week, next month, three months out, right? And that lesson, though, <laughs> seriously, prevents a lot of problems <laughs> down the road because you always can sort of see, you can look forward and see where your cash is going to be. But to your point, like, I never knew that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of those lessons that you learn. You sort of go, OK, well, yeah, that makes sense. So do your portfolio companies today have a chart similar to that? Yeah, they, my portfolio companies <laughs> all know where their cash is today. Yes. <laughs> they yep. can answer that question. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, just some quick fire questions, just so the audience can get to know you a little bit sure. better, Adam. So what's your earliest memory of agriculture? Uh, it would be, so I, I wasn't born in Iowa. My parents are originally from Iowa. So mm -hmm. it was when I moved back to Iowa, I remember both getting the questions before I moved back about all the corn and then seeing all the corn when I moved <laughs> back. And I was like, okay, we are in the heart of agriculture now. Got it. So I remember that uh, specifically. What about, do you have, what's your memory of the first money that you made? Yeah, so that would be probably the, the first company I started, which was a painting company in undergrad. Um, the first, I struggled for a long time to convince, I had never painted a house before. <laughs> so it took me a while to figure out how to, how to get somebody to let me paint their house, basically. Uh, but the first time I did, and they actually paid me for it, and my crew for it, and they were happy with the results, was kind of the first time that I learned, okay, you can actually, if you satisfy a customer, you can actually uh, charge them a fair price and make a little money on the side as well, or on top of that as well. So that was kind of the first the first. Given time. you uh, hadn't painted a house before, where did the decision come from to start a painting company in college? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would go running around campus, and I got increasingly frustrated that there were uh, really beautiful homes in this particular neighborhood on campus that had paint chips falling off the okay. side of the house, and so I just... There was an owner of one home that was taking his garbage out, and I pointed to it, and I said, are you going to do anything about that? <laughs> and he said, well, no, but do you want to do something about that? And that was kind of the first thing that started. So, so yeah. <laughs> Got to be careful what you think about on your runs. Exactly, yes. Uh, next question, who have been the most influential people in your career? Yeah, so two people come to mind. I think I mentioned one previously, uh, Dr. Hank Harris at Harris Vaccines. Um, I, I've never... 
I had never previously been a part of uh, introducing a, an entirely new and novel thing to the world. <laughs> and what Hank, you know, simply by allowing me to sort of be around, showed me was that you can actually do it and do it successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, so he showed me how to do it. I learned how to do it. Um, and it was really fun to do it as well. And, you know, in doing so, we sort of put a dent out there, right? So that was kind of cool. Um, the other one was my predecessor here at Iowa Farm Bureau, uh, Dave Singpeel. Um, a mutual friend. Yes, a mutual <laughs> friend. Uh, he taught me how to essentially be a businessman, um, which, and, and to uh, a thousand other lessons along the way, but um, I would say both those two had the biggest impact on my career so far. Great. We're in agriculture, and so we talked a little bit about that, but at the end of the day, our product is food mm -hmm. <laughs> and nutrition. So if I ask you to think about what your favorite meal or food experience is, no matter where it is or where it was or whatever the food is, what, what comes to mind? It's literally anything on a grill in the summertime. <laughs> okay. It doesn't matter, any kind of meat. It, so this is your time of year. It does not matter, <laughs> yep, this works. Great, yeah. great. Well, Adam, thank you for taking the yeah. time today, and thanks for your support of the Ag Startup Engine, Ag Entrepreneurship, and everything else. Of course. All right.